Welcome to Following Historic Trails. So you think I look funny today, eh? Well, wait until you see my guest. <laughs> uh, we're going to follow some rivers this week. In fact, the next two weeks, we're going to have a little bit of change of pace. You've probably uh, noticed the last few years uh, been involved in a uh, project having to do with the development of our rivers for historical recreational purposes. We're going to show you some pictures of some of the uh, things that have come the last few years about that and, and why I became particularly interested in uh, utilizing our rivers uh, for recreation, which is something that hasn't been done. Uh, everybody seems to ignore the river. You know, we pass over it as we're going to West Lethbridge or whatever, but we don't ever get on the river. And my guest today is Vern Shy, who is a river man. Vern, last year was your first river experience, was it? As far as a uh, trip on, with boat on the river, yes. Now, Vern is, does he look like a bank manager? He was a bank manager when I first met him. Now we've turned him into a full-grown river man. And uh, I think you prefer the river, don't you? Well, I prefer the river to the, <laughs> to the office work. I'll go along with that, yes. Okay. Now, we're going to divide the, this particular series in two parts. The first one, we're going to look at the development of the rivers uh, in this part of the world. And um, a great river trip that anybody can take, not very far from here. And uh, then the second program, we're going to look at the project that we had last year tying in with the Riel Rebellion. So our first series, we're going to go down to the Missouri River. Now, some of you may be familiar with this book here, which came out a year or so ago. Uh, it was about the Trek program that was at Hamilton Junior High. And in the, the first item in the book, or one of the first items, is a series from a diary that one of the students kept when I took them down the river in 1980 during the 75th anniversary of the celebrating of the province of Alberta. And this is the Missouri River Wilderness Waterway. And it was in this area, just east of Fort Benton, Montana, that the sternwheeler, the river boats that we're familiar with, were developed. And from that part of the, the world, they went everywhere. There were river pilots that were involved in the Riel Rebellion 100 years ago who went to Egypt, to the Nile, and did work uh, trying to find a man named Gordon at Khartoum. And that river traffic and these river captains became world famous, and they were originally from this part of the world. A few people realize that. So let's just take a break right now and go over and have a look at the story of the development of the Sternwheeler right here. Okay, Vern. Tell me, which one is you? <laughs> oh, I really can't pick this up up there. Oh, well, I'll tell you, this isn't a picture of us, and uh, it isn't even a picture of Western Canada. What we're trying to show you is how you wouldn't travel in this part of the world. That's your birch bark canoe. It's from a famous painting by a lady named Hopkins, and it's uh, in Eastern Canada, I believe. Now, the birch bark uh, canoe just wouldn't work on our rivers in this area, and that's why. Uh, you'd be going down the river fairly quickly and womp into that uh, piece of tree and that would be the end of your canoe. So in this part of the world, you developed uh, what was really a dugout canoe, dugout from a log. This is a rather poor picture taken in a museum at Helena, Montana, but it's, it shows you the, the digging out and the type of boat that they would have used on the uh, rivers, mainly the Missouri, because the Missouri River was the river that brought all the supplies into uh, northern United States and into southern Alberta originally. From the canoes, they went to the flat boats, and these boats were great for going downstream, uh, but uh, they didn't make any headway going up. And uh, what they would do is load the supplies at a place like Fort Benton, Montana. Uh, they would build the boat, load the supplies, and uh, when they got to St. Louis, uh, Missouri, they would simply sell the the boat and they'd use the boards for sidewalks. They didn't even try to bring them upstream again. From there you go to the keel boat, uh, which was uh, a little bit more luxurious. And here you had long poles, you had some oars, and then you would also have some poles that you could push against 
and, and work your way upstream. Now the Missouri leads to Fort Benton, Montana, then Fort Benton, Montana goes over the Whoop Up Trail to uh, Fort Whoop Up, and here's the picture of the famous Fort Whoop Up in this particular area. Now the trip that we took originally, and this was back in 1980, was from Fort Benton, found right here, and we went downstream past Cow Island, Carroll, to a place called Kipp State Park. And that area is now an, uh, a wilderness waterway preserved by the American government and a trip worth taking. This is uh, the barge. Not quite the same as we were on, is it, Vern? Uh, no, not, not <laughs> quite. Much kind of modern, this one. You'll, say, you'll see uh, when we get to our story that uh, this is much more luxurious than uh, what we did. And where, where was this particular this, boat? This uh, picture is taken at Fort Benton, Montana. So this is the Missouri River. You can see it's a fairly wide river, much wider than we have here. And this is a boat trip you can actually take in the summertime. I'd say maybe cost you three, four hundred dollars, uh, and you go for five days down the Missouri River through the uh, area, that, as I said, that is now a, a park area. Uh, a special barge-type boat. This is uh, uses an outboard motor. And uh, when it isn't raining, and it was when we left, uh, you can take the top off and so on. Also, they, they outfit it so that uh, for your four or five hundred dollars, whatever it is, uh, you can get you get all your meals. You even get a little cup. <laughs> yeah, as, as a matter of interest, how many how many people would that boat accommodate? That maximum? one had uh, I think it's twenty two. In the back here, you have a washroom. Talk about luxury, eh? And uh, this. It's a portable food stand, so that when you're in the boat, uh, everything is found in the cupboards, and then you can also be carried out and taken ashore. Everybody has their cup so that uh, they can um, want a drink of something. They don't have to dirty up the new cup every time. Now, the first people in this area, the first uh, white people, I should say, the first explorers, were Lewis and Clark, who came up here in 1805-06. And of course, when you get into that part, uh, Americans have a very keen interest in their history, and you, you, you learn a lot about Lewis and Clark very quickly. How do you like that boat? Steam engine. That looks like the, uh, what do you call it, Ogopoga and Kelowna Lake or something? <laughs> right. Well, supposedly it was a boat that was developed, uh, it's called the Western something or other, and uh, it was to scare the Indians. You've got to remember in the 1860s and so on, the Sioux were given a lot of problems in that part of the world. And so they came up with this design. I think it probably did the job pretty well. The Mandan Indians uh, had a large, there was a large area of them around Bismarck, North Dakota. And uh, they were painted by a man named Catlin, I believe, in the, about 1830. Very famous pictures, these. The steamboats, the old side wheelers that they had on the Mississippi had, had a difficult time going upstream. As, as, it, as they went further upstream, of course, there was less water and they had all kinds of problems with these side wheelers. And uh, they just couldn't go anywhere. And so once you get par past the area known as Fort Union, which is the junction of the Yellowstone and the Missouri River, which was an old fur trading area, uh, you just didn't have any steamboats. They couldn't make it up. And then over a period of about 50 years, this is uh, that particular area of Fort Union as it looked 15 years ago when I was last there. Uh, once you got past that area, they couldn't take the steamboats, and so you had to go to, uh, you had to use keel boats and, and literally pull them up the river. Here's Bodmer. One of these two men here is Bodmer, who was the first person to paint and describe visually the part of the country that we're really quite close to. Now, this is a map of the actual Missouri. That when you when you float down that river, you can get this map and you can see how all the different islands and so on have names. And you're usually named after boats that sank, uh, because the average life of a stern wheeler on that river was two years. I notice in the bottom uh, right hand corner, uh, Lewis. Is that was that the uh Part of the uh, Lewis, Lewis expedition, Clark. photographer. And yeah, they have it marked where where they camp each night on this map. I think you pay, we paid five dollars for this little booklet, and as we floated down the river, you could 
see how every part was named and they told you stories about the river and, and so on. It's really a, a neat idea. Here, for example, is a, a Labarge rock and it was named after an old uh, Sternwheeler pilot uh, in that area. And uh, this was a painting done by Carl Bodmer. And as you float down the river, you see the same rock. I mean, it hasn't changed very much. And that's one of the nice things about this trip is that there's so many landmarks and they're still there. This is the only part of the Missouri that hasn't changed since the, uh, you know, in the last hundred years. They've put dams on this part of the river and so on, but this has been preserved the same as it was when Lewis and Clark went through. Look at this. Now if you go down the river, there it is. Hasn't changed at all. So it's a trip well worth taking. And here you have your white cliffs area. In fact, this picture is taken from a camping spot uh, along the river. They actually have shelters for the campers to stop at. Well, is there uh, quite a lack of vegetation trees along that part of the river? Or oh, yeah. There? There's not many trees left. Uh, the early sternwheelers <laughs> cut them all down to, to power the boats. Uh, in fact, so there's the stories. One of the stories you learn about as you go down the river is about the, the wood hawkers who uh, simply built little shacks along the river and uh, went around cutting wood and piling it up and selling it to the Sternwheeler captains. Oh, nice. But it was a very risky business because the Sioux were not happy with the Sternwheelers coming into what they considered was their territory. And so the wood hawkers didn't last very long. Hole in the wall. Some of the viewers may remember part of this series uh, was shown last year when we talked about the trip down the Missouri. Is there any significance to that particular hole in the wall, as you call it? Not really, except the fact that, uh, you know, before 1883, all the people that came into southern Alberta would have come up this river. Pretty well everybody. The Mounties, for example, there's even Sternwheelers that were named after Mounties. There's one named after McLeod. And, uh, they, hopefully a lot of these people kept diaries, although I haven't been able to find very many of them, and they would have written about a lot of these landmarks because they were so well known. As you were going up the river, you were always looking for the next landmark so you'd be able to tell how many miles you were. Oh, I see, Benton. so it's sort of a marking, marking yeah. system. Yeah. This is another painting by Bodmer. He, he saw these big cliffs and they reminded him of buildings and so on in Europe, being from Switzerland and so on. And uh, so he painted them as if they were buildings almost. This was a, a Bodmer picture overlooking a, a little place where there's a farm today. And when we, in our last trip, uh, when we were at Fort Mackenzie, which is what this area was called, uh, we saw a lot of artifacts that had been uh, found at the site of the early fort. But is this still in Missouri country? Yeah, this is all the Missouri River. This is the part 155 miles east of Fort Benton, Montana. Now, trying to get a boat with a motor that could take people up that river was a long experience, 50 years. It finally, finally, they designed a boat that didn't require very much water. They moved the wheels from the side of the boats as they were found on the Mississippi to the back, and they found that they could get more leverage, and uh, then they changed the motors and so on, took them out of the hull and put them above so that now instead of being underneath here where they are in most boats, they were ab above the water level. That way, they could design a boat that only required, say, a foot of water. And that was the, the beauty of the sternwheeler that developed. And it just didn't happen all at once. They had to try this and try that and so on. And the first one that made it was the Chippewa. So, so when that innovation came out, you might, you might as well say that the uh, sternwheelers were in, were in business on the Missouri then. That's right. And the sternwheeler was developed, as far as I can figure out, it was developed on the Missouri River, just south of Lethbridge, that's 200 miles to Fort Benton, the other end of the Whoop Up Trail. And from there, the sternwheeler went all around the world. And as I mentioned earlier in the program, there were sternwheeler captains from this area that maneuvered these boats down the Nile uh, in, in the battles of the empire back in the 1880s. Well, well on your trip, uh, are, are there any of the old sternwheelers beached or museum types uh, along the river yet? Or? No. Uh, there might have been some that we never saw them, but there's all kinds of places named after the ones that blew up. See, there was a gold mine, which will be seen a picture of in a few minutes, that developed in central Montana. And uh, that 
brought everybody into Montana, and they, they would get on every old rickety stern wheeler they could find, and they would try to get it up that river. And some of them were pretty bad shape, and they only lasted two years. They would blow up because they'd try to put too much pressure in the boilers, and the boilers had no regulatory devices. Uh, they didn't know how much pressure it could take, and boom, there it, there it would go. Here we are picking up wood along the way to keep our boat going. Well, it was really to keep our stomachs going, I guess, because we needed a campfire at night. But this is the same thing that the stern wheelers would have done uh, over 100 years ago, is picking yeah, up but wood. They, because they, they, they gathered, gathered wood for fuel to keep, keep themselves propelled. That's right. And you can see there isn't much wood around. So that uh, trying to get a, a, a steamboat up there with a little bit of wood was tough. This is, uh, you can see an indentation here. And that's where some of the wood hawkers had a little hut. And uh, we stopped at the site. In fact, this is a grave of one of the wood hawkers who uh, didn't make it. Once the Sioux found out they were there, they were all killed. Well, is, is there an identifying marker at that no, great site? or just so happens that the captain of the boat, as I said, we were outfitted and so on, and the fellow makes the trip every year oh, four so or five times. And so he tells us stories, and he had told us all this stuff. But a fascinating trip. This is Fort Benton. The other, I guess you could say almost the sister of Fort Whoopup, except Fort Benton was made out of mud. This is an adobe fort. And if you don't get down there pretty quick, folks, you're going to miss it because the mud is gradually being washed away. This is one wall that's left. This part here has been rebuilt. But of the original fort, every year it gets smaller. Of the rebuilt section, is that built out of mud too? Oh, yeah, yeah. It was built, I think, probably around 25 years ago. They have a lovely little museum at Fort Benton, and here they depict in a diorama the steamboats coming up the Missouri and docking at what they call a levee. And of course, the levee is a term you associate with the uh, southern United States. Uh, but one of the interesting parts about Fort Benton, and I hope that we can take a tour there later on uh, this year, do some actual film footage of Fort Benton, one of the nice things is that they have a different language. They use different words. We're familiar with people saying crick rather than creek, as we do. But uh, the side of the river is, is the levee. And of course, it shows their connection with the Mississippi. Now, the mines that uh, developed in central Montana brought all kinds of people up the Missouri River in order to try to make their fortune in gold. and. Uh, after the mines finally fell apart, then it so happened that what kept Fort Benton going was the fact that the whiskey trade was starting in southern Alberta. And now they started to go into southern Alberta. So when the gold mines of the 1860s uh, faded away, the trade with southern Canada, uh, namely southern Alberta, started. And so that kept Fort Benton going for another uh, decade or so. So the next part of our story is how the boats developed on the Old Man Belly Saskatchewan River. And this is, of course, is a picture of, I think it's the Alberta, taken at Medicine Hat. And if you look carefully, you'll see it's pretty well the same design of the, as the boats that were on the Missouri. And this is because the people that built these original boats on the Missouri, or on the Old Man, uh, were men like the Todd brothers that came from the Missouri and were hired by the Galt Company to build the boats. And of course, they built the identical boats. So well, you have the same style this here. This particular Alberta uh, boat here, was that built at Medicine Hat? Or it here? was built uh, at Medicine Hat and Lethbridge, part oh, of it oh. here and part of it there. Now, the, the innards, the boilers and so on, uh, they were shipped by rail to, I think it was Swift Current, and then brought overland by carts and outfitted in in um, Medicine Hat. So originally, I think the Baroness, which was the first boat, was built, the wooden part in Lethbridge, and then it was sort of floated down to Medicine Hat. And uh, they put the innards, the boilers in it at that particular well, time. Well, I remember, remember reading an article, I don't know whether it was this particular boat, that one of these turn wheelers that marooned in the river, that the boilers are still supposed to be in the, in the river bottom or in, covered in the sand? And that's possibly the... Um, the Lily, which is one we're going to be looking at later, and it was the one that uh, sank, I think it was in 83, and it was uh, just north of Medicine Hat. We passed it <laughs> on our trip, but of course we didn't find mm -hmm. it. But it, uh, I've run into people that remember still seeing parts of that particular boiler uh, there in the 1920s. 
and we'll be looking at that later. So the next part of our, of our trip after I originally made the trip down the Missouri, I thought, wouldn't it be fantastic to try to recreate something relative to the boats that were on the Old Man River? And so on the 100th anniversary of the start of the Galt Mine in Lethbridge, uh, we had a meeting and we got together and talked about the possibility of designing some boats that would symbolize the coal boats that were developed in Lethbridge and used to carry coal to Medicine Hat over a, a three-year period. And then, of course, they were later used during the Real Rebellion. And so one thing led to the other. It was originally the trip down the Missouri that got me excited about uh, these rivers and, and, you know, the fun that they can be as far as uh, going for a ride. Much more exciting maybe than lakes. How did you, how, how did you find going down a river as compared to going on a boat trip on a lake? Oh, uh, uh, the, the boat trip on the river is much, much interesting because you have so many curves and each one is, is a new experience. Each, each, each curve or bend in the river is, is different. A lake, well, you just have your northeast south and see it all. Why do you think everybody spends their time on the, on the lakes and ignores the rivers? Well, perhaps like myself, they've never had the experience. I never, never thought of, of uh, making a boat, boat trip. Yeah. You're really missing out on, uh, on a wonderful experience. Well, this particular thing got us going. And, and uh, so following the 100th anniversary of the start of the coal mines, we started looking towards the setting up of, a, of an excursion uh, down the old man to Medicine Hat. And when we first came up with this idea, the concept was that we would build a raft, maybe, and people would build little rafts with phony little uh, wheels to represent a stern wheel and uh, actually just sort of float down, push our way down to Medicine Hat in a, in a one-time thing. And of course, what really happened was the people actually developed some working stern wheelers. And we floated down, but we did it mechanically. And not only did it work as, as uh, a one-year event, uh, the people were so excited that uh, we continued on and did it a second year. and. Uh, and a third year, and I, I assume that uh, they're still planning on doing it in the future, and we hope more and more people will get involved. Yeah, I, I was down there, what was it, a few years ago when the boys were all taken off, and that uh, the interest was was pretty great. Well, yeah. I, don't, I don't think it's uh, fallen down. In fact, I think it's probably improved. The boats have got bigger and bigger, and of course, uh, this is what happened in real life as well, that as we had wet years, uh, they kept building bigger boats <laughs> and then uh, all of a sudden you get hit with a dry year as we had last mm -hmm. summer and uh, all these big boats uh, can't go anywhere so that uh, of the three years that they've done the trip to medicine hat the last year was the worst they had the toughest time and uh, i'm talking to uh, martin dixon the president of the stern Wheelers organization now he says they're going in for smallness again uh, something that will actually be able to get down the river no matter what the conditions are like. Well, with, with the unpredictability of water levels, I guess the uh, smaller, low, low-bodied boats would probably be more practical. This is the uh, trip where we did the first, uh, this was on the 100th anniversary of the launching of the original Stern Wheeler in Lethbridge. And there you have the Mayor Anderson and Mr. Thacker. Uh, and uh, these fellows that look like the cough drop people. Remember the Smith Brother cough drop people? <laughs> sure, well, that's a good one. Good fact, somebody, right? <laughs> that's the Nobleford group. And uh, they had their fancy boat. And we now have two pictures lined up. But I think we're going to stop here anyway and continue next week on uh, the second part of this expedition, which is the trip down the Saskatchewan River to commemorate the Riel Rebellion. So let's sit down now and finish off. Well, it's time now to give away our book, which we've forgotten about the last few weeks. But uh, if you look at this book, the 100th Anniversary Plan book, in the first few pages, you'll find some pictures of the Missouri River trip. And uh, here we are on the barge getting started. And there's that fantastic formation that is recorded by Carl Bodmer and is exactly the same when you go down today. Now we should have a, uh, a question. And the question is, if you were to take the river trip down the Missouri River, where would you start from? If you think you know the answer, and you'd like to have a copy of the 100th Anniversary Plan Book, then just phone the station, and if you're the first person, 
it's yours. Now, I haven't had much time to talk to you, Vern, but I wanted uh, the audience to get to know you because next week, Vern's going to be my partner. We're going to be isolated out on the middle of a uh, what we said, desert island. Not quite a desert island, but it felt like it. No food. And uh, if we had been a few days uh, later, we would have been in a snowstorm, right? And we're going to talk about our tremendous trip that we had last year going from Galt Island down the Saskatchewan River to Batoche, where we arrived on the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Batoche. It was a really a great trip. We'll see you next week. <laughs>